and the <coughs> first uh, lecture of this meeting is uh, the uh, Rena New Flacker Memorial Lecture. For those of you that uh, are not aware, Dr. Rena New Flacker used to be the chief of interventional radiology here at MUSC. He uh, was originally from Brazil and moved to the United States. He was a pioneer in the field of interventional radiology and we lost him in 2011. And because of his leadership, we, uh, we, we put together this uh, memorial lecture for him. How do I move? Renan was not only uh, passionate about interventional radiology and taking care of patients, he was also passionate about cars, and especially old cars. And he um, used to work and restore old cars. Uh, this is uh, one of the cars that he restored and he brought from Brazil. And the story is that w this was the first car that he ever drove in Brazil. And then with time, he was able to uh, bring it to US. And he was a very, very fan of Alfa Romeos. That was his favorite brand. So he had a couple of Alfa Romeos uh, at home. I'm very passionate, very passionate about taking care of patients. Uh, very talented interventional radiologist with very gifted hands. Uh, nothing was uh, too complex for him. Uh, he did research, animal work. He was an inventor. He was a great teacher, gave great lectures. So he has, he had everything that you need to have to be a leader in this uh, particular field. This was our last picture of the group at that time. Uh, since then, uh, our group has grown, and we have uh, now three more members of, of the team in IR. But as it was mentioned before, we have the spirit of collaboration. So for us, the team is not only IR. The team is IR, vascular surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, interventional cardiology. And this is something that Renan brought from Europe. Uh, and we used to have it in our wall. Yesterday, I learned that this piece broke uh, when uh, we were doing some, uh, some work in, 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 in our place, but somebody already um, volunteered to reproduce this little plaque that said, the impossible, I do it immediately. A miracle may take me a little longer. And those was, that was the spirit of Renan. So here we are, uh, we, ha we are with this lecture in 2012. The lecture was done by Bain Selby, 2013, Barry Katzen, last year, Mike Dake. Uh, for this year, we have the privilege to have here Dr. Mark Woolley. So Dr. Mark Woolley, it's also one of the pioneers of interventional radiology. And, uh, he trained in Mayo Clinic. He did something that uh, was very unique. He did a NIH fellowship in Sweden. And as he mentioned to me, that was something that really changed his life in terms of uh, what he saw in Sweden and what he brought to the United States. And basically, he did, he did his career at the University of Pittsburgh. And he worked in close collaboration with the people of Carnegie Mellon University. And they were involved in multiple projects. Uh, again, taking consideration that these were the times where many of the things that we are using now did not exist. So he was part of the guys who developed these type of things, materials, techniques. So the injector that we use in every single hospital in the United States nowadays was Mark's idea. He knew that originally we didn't have a very friendly using machine to inject contrast. And he came with this idea and he partnered with another person and founded a company by the name of Medrad. 
and you see there the pictures of those initial devices. Everybody is also familiar with the woolly wire. How many times a day we use that woolly wire? And that woolly wire is a phenomenal tool. Uh, and that was created by, by Mark. You know, very steerable, uh, very gently wire. And then it has this magic capability to be able to grow from 150 to longer because of the locking mechanism. Thank you, Mark, for that, really. We really appreciate that every day. And Mark also developed some of the initial uh, protection devices for carotid artery stenting. I, I was putting together this lecture and went through his uh, intellectual property uh, material. And this is 1988. Here is a patent uh, from Mark talking about the device for balloon angioplasty with a filter distally integrated for protection for distal embolization. And he mentioned specially designed or for more interest for carotid stenting, 1988. So what about the connection between Uflacker and Wooly? Well, Uflacker also went to Europe to, the, to do his training, but he didn't go to Sweden, he went to Norway. And then when he came back from Norway, he went and visited Mark. In 1977, he became a visiting vascular and interventional fellow at the Department of Radiology at Shady Hospital in Pittsburgh. And they were working together, and uh, I, for what uh, Renan told me at the time, uh, even uh, Mark invited him to stay in the United States, uh, but I think that at that time uh, Renan was, was dating Elena and he, he needed to go back to Brazil uh, and then uh, he stayed in Brazil for a while before he came back here. I met Mark in a meeting in Brazil. I don't know if you remember, Mark, was the Club dos Angiografistas in Brazil, in, in Sao Paulo, where we were both giving lectures about bronchial embolization. I was very young, he was the big professor there, and that's where I met him. And here on the right, you have a picture where both Renan, on the right, and uh, Mark on the left were in a meeting in Rome. This is in Rome. And there is another guy by the name of Pinto there that we, we still don't know who was. Did you? I don't know if you were able to find out who was that guy. But uh, so this is the uh, short introduction for Mark. Thank you very much for coming. It's a real honor uh, to have you here. Please come up and give us your lecture. Thank you, Mark. Okay. okay. Well, uh, it's an impressive introduction. I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, this is a picture. I thought it was 1976. But anyway, I was with Ren in here. But uh, Ren and I were together when uh, there was very little regulation. There was no F FDA was not a problem, was not an issue. And uh, IRBs were not an issue. So it was really a honeymoon era. So uh, Ren and I were, Ren is very creative, a great guy. But he came with me, I think, for neuro training, and uh, he, he was he was good from the beginning. So I said, Renan, I think you're wasting. He spent about six months with me, and I sent him to one of our community hospitals. We had five or six community hospitals. I said, Renan, look, you're making fellowship wages here. You're already well trained. You don't need this. I said, go up to the community hospital. It's a 300 bed hospital. And you can run the hospital, run the whole interventional part. Although intervention was nothing then. So he said, okay. So he went to Allegheny Valley. And he stayed there for the remainder of the year and then came back to Brazil for Elena. But a very talented guy. And we co cooperated on almost every device he, he talked to me about and I talked to him about the same thing. This picture Claudio gave to me, I'm embarrassed that I don't have pictures of Renan. But I, was, I thought it was 1976 and I thought it was in Rome also. So the question was, uh, who, who wore pants like that? <laughs> I, mean, I said, I said that, that old? I don't believe it. But uh, I'll tell you one quick story. And Claudio did a beautiful job on Renan. So uh, Renan and I, I was, a, I was a consultant at the VA also. So at that time, we just 
developing some series on the angiographic injector, because that we converted to a flow rate controlled injector. So we're doing an angiogram at the VA. The first time we'd use the flow rate control. And uh, obviously, we injected ionic contrast media with, I think it was like 45 cc's, 20 cc's a second over just, just learning. And the patient starts screaming, stood up right on the table, ran and thought we killed the patient. So I said, no, it's just the contrast. But we could do those things without a lot of regulatory issues. Then one quick story. We were doing a dog in the, animal, in the angiographic suite. Was, we didn't have an animal lab. We were doing the dog in the hospital. So we were doing a dog in the lab. And uh, the mayor came in with a, question, with a question of pulmonary embolus. So Ren and I, we took the dog off the table, put the, put the mayor on the table right after we did the dog, did the pulmonary arteriogram. But we could get away with that. Christ, you go to jail if you did that today. But uh, anyway, it was a great experience with Ren. I really uh, miss him a lot. So there's a picture we saw before. So, so I'm going to review with you carotid stenting, at least from its inception right to up its present, and show you some advantages, but some major, major limitations at the end of this talk that we're coming into now with carotid stenting. So carotid stenting, like, there's no end of the controversy. I think that's an accurate statement. I think there's no procedure in the history of the country that has had more issues than carotid stenting, my disclosures. So in the early studies, we were very limited. One. We were inexperienced, and two, we had uh, absence of experienced operators, and more importantly, uh, we had first-generation devices and bad patient selection. We just made all the mistakes we could. Then, uh, compared to CAS, we know, is a technology in evolution, so it's continually changing. So all of these trials that we've been in with, with uh, CAS, they're obsolete before we finish the trial. So that's a problem when you're dealing with uh, you know, technology and evolution. It's tough to be consistent. In the meantime, CEA has been around for 63 years. So they made the same mistakes early on, too, when they review. You can see early on in the 80s, there were complications from endarterectomy as well, but they slowly corrected all of that to see where we're now with ACAS and NASAT. They got the act together, and obviously, dramatic improvement and still very good procedure. Now, when we look at the results from carotid stenting, the best paper that has come out of Germany, all experienced operators doing 55 cases or more, only eight of them, eight hospitals, all experienced operators, they come up with some very, very impressive results. For example, on the overall, so death 0.25, any stroke 1%, death in any stroke 1%, minor strokes 0.6%. So, We've never duplicated those results in this country, ever. These are the best results I've ever seen for carotid stenting. But it's a registry. And registries, are difficult to judge the registries you know, without randomizing. Our problem with carotid stenting is we never know when a stroke's going to happen. We still don't know. And you take, for example, this problem. Here's a patient with an 85% stenotic lesion on, 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 your, on the right here. And you can see. Uh, this patient would be eligible to enter trial for stenting if the patient chose, or surgery. The patient chose to do nothing. On the other hand, the patient here with this 45%, 43% lesion didn't need anything anyway because it's not stenotic enough to indicate a, a procedure. So then the patient with the high-grade stenotic lesion chooses to do nothing, comes back, not, no issues. And uh, the patient on my right, you can see the 45% lesion, there was no reason to do anything, so this patient was followed conservatively. However, four or five months later, the patient on, with an 85% lesion comes back normal, still doing nothing. And the patient with a 43% lesion comes back with a major, major hemispheric stroke, frontal parietal major stroke. So the question is, the 43% lesion, this is the issue. We don't know, still don't know, when a stroke's gonna occur with stenting, difficult. One other quick case. This is a patient came in, obviously, with right-sided 50, 60% stenosis. Question about doing anything. But on the other side, left side, a symptomatic high-grade preocclusive lesion. So we have to make a decision. Should we dilate the right side or stent the right side and improve the collateralization across the functioning ACOM to the left hemisphere? Because there's an excellent flow to the left hemisphere, including MC filling from the right side. So if that were a string sign, you would do nothing. But on the other hand, it's symptomatic. 
the left side. So we said, well, we'll evaluate this patient with IVUS. At that time, we were doing IVUS on every carotid stent, getting an idea. Could we stratify the risk with IVUS and then make a decision to stent or not to stent based on the IVUS? And you can see on this side, IVUS, this is all fibrous fibrous hyperplasia, but there's no necrotic core and there's no uh, ulceration. So we said, okay, we could go ahead with a left lesion, and we did. And we get a great result on the left lesion. But again, pointing out, we using ultrasound as a, a guidance. Then, so we did 70 patients with ultrasound, seeing if we could eliminate the stroke risk by using IVUS. We had three strokes in the 70 patients, so look, IVUS is still not the answer to stroke. This is a patient, obviously, with a type C lesion. This patient clearly needs surgery. This is not a stenting case. It's ulceration. It's a pre high-grade preocclusive lesion. But sometimes the patient re refuses to have it. On the other hand, this patient has necrotic core around the intima, has dystrophic calcification, and intimal hyperplasia as well. So those characteristics, at least on the basis of IVA, say surgery. We stented this patient because he refused surgery, and he did well. So, you know, basically, they're still searching. So now I think OCT may be the way to go. OCT is unbelievable resolution, incredible resolution. You can see this is high-grade stenotic lesion, and on the OCT, you can see on the bottom frame, you see vulnerable plaque. And the vulnerable plaque is not where the stenotic region is. So you can see the thin-capped fibroatheroma that's ulcerated and dissected. It's, that's just a, a complex way to happen. So based on that, on OCT, we said, like, maybe we should stent longer lesion, use longer stents because we don't know where a vulnerable plaque is. So we have the focal lesion, yes, here you can see, we can take care of that, but now extend. So we're using almost exclusively now 4CM stents just to cover what potentially may be vulnerable plaque proximal to the target lesion. So what have we overlooked in this whole process? We overlooked the aortic arch. The aortic arch is a harvest of vulnerable plaque. And, uh, in days gone by, we were doing stupid things like this. Whether it's common carotid lesion, diffuse disease. These are very, very complicated situations of common carotid. But you can see common extensive stenosis there, question of vulnerable plaque there, question of clot here, un unreasonably type 3 aortic arch. So all these issues, all these issues are not standing or surgical indications. So, so then we said, well, how do we avoid then the aortic arch? We'll go percutaneous. So in Sweden, in the early days, we, we did all carotids were done direct puncture. So we were very experienced with direct puncture. So then I went, uh, Patrice Bergeron in Marseille was doing carotid stenting transcarotid with a percutaneous approach. So I spent some time with Patrice in the direct carotid puncture. And surprisingly, it's not that difficult. And he's, here it is with a star closed as an entry site. So uh, basically, under fluoroscopy, you isolate C5. You have plenty of room below C5. You have plenty of room before you get to the bifurcation. And subsequently, this is done also with a micro needle, 21 gauge needle. And then subsequently, the, the six French sheath passed over that and then positioned in the internal carotid. So, uh, and his good results, good result. So, what we've learned about the, uh, the direct carotid access is one, it takes the arch out of the way. An arch in the choice trial was responsible for 18% of the stroke, so the arch is a danger zone. So, so I think if you're manipulating the arch for 10 or 15 minutes, you're only waiting for an embolus to occur. And then unfortunately, the emboli that are occurring from the arch are frequently involved in posterior circulation, so or the contralateral side. So that's what happens, that bilateral stroke. So where are we going with transcarotid? The Roadster trial is an interesting trial. It's just, it's still, I guess it's finished in Rome, and I guess as FDA approval or waiting for it. But in the pivotal arm, they had stroke death in MI at only 3.5% and stroke 1.4%. So these are very, very low numbers. So there's no, no question that when we get on into this lecture, I will show this may be the way we have to go for managing carotid stenting. We may have to go flow reversal of some sort because I'm not quite certain the filters are going to make it. So when then we came to Crest, well, Crest proved equipoise between stenting and surgery. After four years, you can see the capital market curve almost identical. So that was established, and I'm not going to bore you with this lecture because I've been over this 100 times. However, this was a $100 million trial, and it was a landmark trial, and the data was superb, never before matched either surgical or stenting. However, however, there was a 2%, roughly 2% difference between stenting and endarterectomy, and the surgeons make a big deal about this. They say, you have twice as many strokes as we do, which is true, but it's 2% and 4%, but it's different. So 
I would like to see one trial, one trial, where stenting was better than surgery. So we said, well, how are we going to correct it? Well, I think we've started to correct it because, one, let's look at the filters. So we, we did a very detailed study at CMU on the filters to see if we could correct that. So we did a comparative bench stop. We're doing here, you can see on the bottom, we're comparing all these filters in, in a physiological flow model. So it's very, very precise, and I'll show you a little bit of, as we move on here. So what we found out was this. Acunet is a good filter, but not a great filter. And Acunet was used in Crest. And Aculink, which is a decent stent, but not a great stent, was used in Crest. So we say, we compared now with Abbott, Acunet to to uh, NAV6. And you see here, there's a 50% difference between NAV6, the current, current filter, versus Acunet. So we say, there's a 50% difference in the small particles. So would that have corrected the 2% stroke difference between uh, standing and crest? Possible? Possible. So obviously, very few people are using Acunet. Almost everybody using the Abbott system is using NAV6. Now, that was a small particle, it was 147 micron particles. Now when we went to 200 micron particles, the filters are fairly efficient. You can see, not a big difference between Acunet and NAV6 in the large particle. And this is important. Now when you look at the capture efficiency across these filters, when you compare to Acunet, Angiogard, FilterWire, Gore, NAV6, and Spider. Spider has large pore size. Spider didn't capture any of the particles. No, part, no particle efficiency at all in Spider because of the large porosity. It has advantages, but obviously these disadvantages. When you look at Gore, Gore is presently the most efficient filter we have. And I have no biased interest in Gore. I do in EPI, in the filter wire. But you can see filter wire surprisingly still functioning effectively, and NAV6 is acceptable. Certainly better than Acunet. So these were the filters we tested. Now, you can see, this is a diagrammatic illustration. You can see. Every, every step you do with, with carotid standing with filter, you can see if you're going to use a filter, you have to aspirate on every stage. Every stage has to be aspirated after you complete it. Because one, you can see, moving along here, you can see this particle simply continually going up. Now, this is designed to show very effective capture, but in fact, I'll show you some really illustrations that we did on the bench top. You can see how inefficient the capture is. Now. Let me go on to the next one. So here's the case. There's a high grade stenotic lesion you can see in the internal carotid. And you and notice the one, the external occipital collateralizing going down to the vertebral. So these are observations you want to make at the time of the procedure because one, now you have basal insufficiency with a high grade stenotic lesion. So you need to know that additional risk that's present. And a satisfactory result here. Great result. We're very happy with the result. Then, we have an MRI. You see the pre and the post. So now we have three embolic events. You call them particles. They are particles, but they're really emboli. They're ischemic emboli. They're asymptomatic. So asymptomatic. Are they really asymptomatic long term? I mean, who needs these particles in your brain? So, so here's another lesion. It's a tight lesion here. And you can see uh, great result. And now we have, this is more than a little embolic particle. This is an infarct of the occipital lobe that occurs. So asymptomatic patient. So I think diffusion-weighted imaging is becoming critical to these procedures. We should have, probably routinely have them. You can see here in this situation, this is a spider. And uh, you can see spider, it almost looks like the filter's not even there. You could, the particle's going by. So you can see that. And also when you recapture it on this, it, bend at the simulated carotid. So I'm not being critical of it. I'm just being this is the facts on the bench top. So if it's on the bench top, it's going to occur in a human. Now when we look at the gore, the gore still has microemboli. You can see it's much more efficient. You can see it capturing much more efficiently. But still, there's no question that the microemboli are occurring. But more efficiently here. So, so you see the gore particle. Very few particles on the gore. So what are these particles? What are these particles that we're seeing? Well, they're composition we don't know. They're fibrin conglomerates, trapped erythrocytes, foam cells, cholesterol cells, calcificate, discrophic calcification, fresh thrombus, old thrombus. So it's a whole host of particles that when we analyze the filters. So now we're doing a study on animals to see what size particles are critical in terms of infarction. 
Now, when we look at the multi-center registries, 32, 32 centers clearly showed CAS had 37% embolic events. CEA at 10%. We look, 10% is acceptable. Closed cell stents, 31%. Open cell stents, 51%. Makes sense. And uh, we think that at this point in time, the, these brain lesions, are, it's still an unsettled issue. So we're very interested in that. And we're, to the point where we're wondering if these patients with these embolic events require dual antiplatelet therapy to prevent stroke. So at least we're getting some interest in this. Then you can see the difference between flow control, proximal flow control in red and the CAS in blue. So you can see almost a 50% difference here, but still, proximal flow control still has emboli, not insignificant in the Schofer trial, you can see. So it's still not the answer. So proximal flow control is good, better than standing, but still not there yet. Now when we look again at another study, 161 patients, new lesions post MRI, 42% in two strokes with stenting, 11% two strokes with endarterectomy. So CAS has a higher particle lesion, volume, and defects. And more persistent, on follow-up, persistent, these little embolic events are still visible on the MRI six months post-procedure. So, so what do we think about? What's, how do we summarize this up? Well, whether these silent ischemic lesions cause permanent cognitive lesions or transient ischemic attacks it's still unknown. We don't know. But I can tell you this, it's not good. So these embolic ischemic particles visible on a diffusion-weighted imaging post the peri procedure, CES, can't be good. But they're asymptomatic. But so are some of these lesions we see that are clearly visible as infarct, asymptomatic. So I think what it must depend on, it depends on the volume of particles and the size of the particles. And that's what we're presently studying. So. How else do we look at this? Well, early on we thought, we'll improve, the, we'll improve the stent, and the stent will act as our filter, an inherent filter, at least improve. So we have this closed cell stent, and we developed a mesh, and this mesh closed over, and then we thought, we'll capture the small particles. But no, no matter how fine the mesh is, it's still capturing 600 micron particles, which you can see. So, we're not worried about the 600 micron particles. Everything's fairly efficient with that. It's the 60 micron. It's the 75 micron. We don't capture those, and that's where the interest is. Now, so then subsequently, uh, Gore came out with a very nice stent. It has a mesh on it, but it's also 500 microns. So we're not looking at 500 microns. We know we can capture that. We know we captured 200 microns. What we didn't capture on those slides I showed you was 147 micron, and we never captured any 60 microns. That's the issue. That is a major issue. Oh, this was a precise stent. We put a, a, a non-metallic nanopore surface coat on here for drug elution in the carotid thinking. Restenosis rate is only maybe five to 10 percent, but if that we had a drug eluting stent, it would help. But with the absence of any funding and research money and lack of interest in anything new in the carotid, we had to put that procedure on hold. So is the only solution we have that we can match and our directive. What is the solution? The solution is we've got to cover the stent. It's the only solution. So that's not a difficult task. So we, we build a, a, either a bifurcated with fenestrated limb for the external, or we take the external, one of the two, because the external is not critical, but interesting if it collateralizes the vert. But these are things that can be done. And I, I think this is the only solution we have that will really match, really match the endarterectomy, with the exception of direct transcarotid access that roads for trial might evolve. And we could go that route. But on the other hand, it would seem to me with the roads to trial, the surgeon is going to do an arteriotomy. They might as well operate. So here's Crest 2. So Crest 2 now is a $150 million trial. And it's be seven years. So we ask ourselves, what, what are we trying to prove? We know that, that endarterectomy is a good procedure. And we know crowd standing is borderline, but getting better. So I'm not sure why we're doing Crest 2. We've already spent $300 million in carotid studies to date. So now we put this on, we almost have $500 million. So I said to myself, 
Chris, too, reminds me of a comment that Michael DeBakey made and was published when NASSET was just beginning. So Michael DeBakey said, why would I enroll in NASSET when I already know the answer? So we feel, at least I do, I feel we already know the answer to Crest 2. We know the answer. Crest 2, in contrast to Crest 1, at least Crest 1 was defined. One filter, one step. Now we have Crest 2, say, use any filter you want. Even though, all of them? Yeah, anything. And use any stent you want. But they forget to say, when they design the trial, these, these devices are not all equal. So why are we picking the best device I'll be something biased but say, why don't we have a gore filter and maybe a new gore stent? That's a trial. And at least and you could lose, but at least you did it with the best technique. So what's the take-home message? The take-home message is that CAS doesn't have a chance of winning. I'll take all bets. All bets. Does not have a chance to win against CEA. And it definitely doesn't have a chance to win against best medical management. Because one, they're enrolling 70% lesions. We don't need to do anything with 70% lesion. So best medical management I will definitely beat CAS under the existing technology and under the existing structure of Crest 2 with its choice of whatever you want. Now, CEA, there's no reason for the surgeons to enroll. They, don't, they can operate these patients, they get reimbursed, so what's the advantage of the surgeon enrolling in Crest 2? They'll do it out of goodwill just to see that it's better than, better than best medical management. So CEA will win over best medical management. I'll take those bets. So. The ischemic particles are becoming a major issue. I think as we develop more and get a better understanding of what's happening intracranially, I think these particles will become a major issue in the Crest 2 study. I don't say terminate the trial, but if it's bad enough, I think the trial will be stopped. And then secondly, I think the Roadster trial is the most impressive we've seen to date. And uh, I think, just finally, I think a covered stent, if we want to participate, I think the covered stent, we're going to have to think about that seriously. And thrombosis has always been an issue, but, you know, thrombosis, in the aneurysms we've done in carotid, they've done very well with the covered stent. So I think basically that gives you a pretty good idea where we're going with uh, carotid stenting. Thanks.